all love a super saloon because it conforms to that most simple recipe. Take something ostensibly ordinary and garnish it with something extraordinary. A poached egg dusted with truffle, a Mercedes taxi with 585 horsepower. Say that again to yourself. The latest E63S is very close to the 600 horsepower mark and in the UK it's two-wheel drive only. This automotive niche is potentially the silliest of all. Power for the sake of power. Only the M6 Grand Coupe doesn't look silly at all. It looks, to my eyes, utterly beautiful. Long, low and slender. It's a perfect two-finger wave to the bangle years. It also runs 560 horsepower, seats just four people and, like the Merc, ruins only its rear tyres. The third car is blue. You can probably see just how blue. It's the most powerful Jaguar saloon ever. It's also the oldest design here and it has a massive rear wing because it wants to have a massive rear wing. You got it? It also has 550 horsepower. And why isn't the Mercedes a CLS to rival the Grand Coupe and why isn't there an RS7 and why am I not taller? Because otherwise there'd be nothing to argue about on the internet. That's why. This test was designed to see how much fuel we could use, or at least that's how it felt. We drove on road, went to Landau to skid around and had a drag race too. They really are bonkers cars. Right, peeps. These three cars are everyday usable saloon cars, right? I accept that. That means they are big and comfortable, relatively comfortable, and they're usable and they're based on quite ordinary cars, but they've also got a load of power and they're rear wheel drive and I just can't resist it. I've been trying to avoid coming and doing stupid things in them, but that's what they're there for, isn't it? I want to do some skids. So I'll talk you through what they're like on the road, but the reality is on the road, the differences really are in comfort. They're so bloody fast that you actually just cannot use them most of the time. It's crazy. I mean, the BMW, when you see the performance figures on the BMW, they'll melt your brain. So, good old Landau circuit. You'll love this. Dan from Jaguar, I promised you I wouldn't take it to Landau, but I'm at Landau. I quite like it here. We've been to Buntingbourne, which kind of excuses it. This sort of tight infieldy bit, well, that's quite technical. It's quite technical, and it's quite slippery, as you can see. And this is how everyone that buys an XFRS will drive it, I can assure you. <laughs> it's an absolute monster. Look at that, third gear, 90 miles an hour, and you're drifting up. This has a lovely balance, this chassis. This is the easiest car of the three, would you believe it, to do this in. The tyre breakaway is nice, it's a Pirelli, the wheelbase is long, the steering is the right speed, you know, everything about it is kind of made for doing what I'm do doing now. Christ, that's slippery there. Um, it's just mega, it feels very natural. Downsides, the diff is electrically actuated, so effectively it's got an electric motor that pushes the plates together. And that is a bit of a problem because it, it does overheat and it gets, it means that I can do this for a short while and then after that it has enough and it gave up the ghost on me earlier. But you know, that is probably the least sensible criticism of a XFRS that I can make. You know, this, this car is not quite the item of the other two. It isn't quite there. It doesn't have that kind of rock hard, unbreakable performance feel. It's the slowest in a straight line. It's a lovely chassis on the road though. And that is really the point of this test. The, the nub of this test is that one of these cars is just amazing when you really get up it. The other two aren't quite as spectacular and this is one of them. You can guess what the other one is. I love doing this. I do love driving this car in this manner. I just think it's sublime. And it's so ridiculously pointless. Oh dear. It's a great engine too. Again, it's probably the least impressive engine here, but the standard's so high, it makes great noise, the throttle response is good. Oof. If you have one of these for a year, you'd have an absolute riot in it. Well done, Jaguar. 
the XFRS proves, above all else, that you have a sense of humour. So, I'm now in an M6 Grand Coupe. This is a proper M car, it really is. 1950 kilograms, but it just doesn't feel that big and heavy to me. And the difference here is the powertrain. The powertrain is just absolutely extraordinary. Because it's aggressive and you have to get up it and, and use all of it. And then this car comes alive, and it comes alive in a way that the others, I'm afraid, can't match. For me, it's so exciting. It doesn't even feel turbocharged either. You can just rev it all the way out. You can make little throttle adjustments to it that you can't in the other. I mean, this is, look at this. Third gear, hanging it out. Oh. Totally irrelevant to whether you should buy one or not, but for me, Completely addictive. Completely addictive. And the balance, the balance is just sublime. Flipping Ada. And the gearbox again. It has another step beyond the others. The others are good and they shift fast, but this thing is immediate. But I'm left asking one question. The M6 Grand Cooper is actually a bit, probably a bit better on track than it is on the street. And it's a street car, isn't it? And there's another car that runs it very, very close on the road. And it's also made in Germany. And I'm going to knock off now and just carry on driving this and not waste my time talking to you because I'm thoroughly enjoying it, as you can see. Wow. Pointless motoring journalism oversteer. I don't care what you say. I love it. AMG S is the most powerful car here. It feels more like a hot rod than either of the other two, which is strange because the power output's not that far beyond them, but it's the personality of the car. This is a much blunter instrument when you're doing this kind of thing than the BMW. Whereas the BM really comes alive, I wouldn't say the Merc flounders, but it just becomes quite unruly but in an altogether hilarious way. There she goes, there she goes, there she goes, there she goes. <laughs> These are saloon cars for God's sake. Where it's lacking compared to the other two is the gearbox. The ZF 8-speed in the Jag is really quite good now. Well, it's great, isn't it? We know it is, although that calibration isn't one of the best I've driven. The BMW's gearbox for doing this is a different league. And this old Merc thing, it's strange, isn't it? It calls into question you know, the need for these cars to be good on track. I'm not sure they do need to be. Whereas, quite well, snappy coming back, isn't it? Um, on the road, this is still a lovely gearbox when you leave it in, in drive. It's just doing this sort of stuff. It's a bit lumpy and reluctant to change and all a bit slow. But, you know, come on. You can't have it all, can you? I mean, a saloon car that can do that, that's just nuts, isn't it? It's still very, very good at this. The brakes are good, the steering's lovely. This has the nicest steering of all three, this car, on road and track. And there's something about the personality of the car. Everyone that's driven this E63 has kind of nodded and gone, that's the one I'd like to spend more time in. 
and I know why. It's just, it's a little, it's a muscle car. That's what it is. It's a muscle car. So the BMW is the best at going fast and sideways on a circuit, which is almost completely irrelevant, but nice to know. On the road, the Mercedes really comes good, though. The ride is a little better, the steering gives a greater sense of connection, and the whole car feels much smaller than the M6. If the MCT transmission now feels old next to the BMW's dual clutch and the 8-speed ZF in the Jag, it counters with that silly motor and its 590 foot-pounds of torque. Squeeze and it just flies. The Jag can't quite match the Merc out here. Its ride is firmer, the whole car feels busier, and even though it's still crazy fast by normal standards, it's the slowest of the three and traction limited on damp roads. And it feels the oldest. The shell sometimes cries foul under all that pressure. The M6 is a strange mix of excitement and composure. It's almost too big for UK roads and it's less relaxing than the E63. The powertrain just wants to be working hard the whole time. It's addictive too, and strangely a car that's very hard to keep below the speed limit. Which has the best motor? All round, probably the AMG, with one large proviso we'll explain later. The XFR supercharged V8 pulls hard but lacks the throttle response of the BMW and the sheer punch of the E63. The M6 struggles to make a decent noise, but is very, very effective. As for the basic packages, well, the M6 feels easily the most special here, the Merc easily the most ordinary, and the Jag easily the cheapest, because its cabin and trim are now a long way behind the Germans. The Grand Coupe is a very, very special machine indeed. Expensive, but probably worth the extra over an M5. At the drag strip, it would show why. So, I'm sitting in an M6 Grand Coupe. I'm really enjoying this car. But we're at Bruntingthorpe and this is about speed rather than enjoyment. This car's 1950 kilograms. That's very, very heavy. In fact, it's the heaviest car here. Next to me, an XFRS in that subtle shade of blue with a subtle spoiler on the back of it. Well over 550 horsepower and lighter than this car. And the other side of that is the Mercedes AMG E63, but it's got the S pack on it. So that's the most powerful car and it's also the lightest car which is quite interesting. So, let's see what happens. Let's see what happens. Let's give Damien a ring, so he can basically get us going. I'm in first gear. We'll drive it off the line and see who wins. Check this out. <laughs> Check this out. They are really fast cars, and this thing obliterates them in a straight line. I don't know whether it's the gearbox, I don't know whether the horses in Munich are a little bit stronger, but this just does the numbers. That's it, the limits are straight away. I'm doing 166 and I've stopped. Now look what happens with the Merc. The Merc doesn't have the 155 limiter. Woo! These are fast cars. And so that was that. Quite how a BMW that weighs 105 kilograms more and has 35 horsepower less than an E63 can do that, I cannot tell you. But the M6 is ballistically fast. Over 130 miles an hour, it just flies. And for some people, just knowing that the M6 Grand Coupe can look so good and demolish the opposition in a drag race will be enough. The counterpoint is this. Three of the five people who drove all three preferred the E63 as a road car. Everyone admired the Jag, but placed it last. And me? Look, it's a close call, but it just has to be the M6. It's a stunning car. Would a CLS have done better? I don't know. That's for the internet to decide. A rubbish launch from me. But look what happens. So that's bye-bye Mr. AMG. That's supposed to have more power than me, but it hasn't.